Hello and welcome to another episode of Through an Opaque Lens with me, Niall Murphy. I'm recording this on the 3rd of July, the afternoon here of the 3rd of July, 2024. And of course, it's the day before the UK general election. So I don't know what to expect there, Be quite interesting. Now, of course, that means that um, as I'm in the Philippines and I'm seven hours ahead of BST, that kind of means that election night, so to speak, will be in the small hours, like five in the morning for me. So the 5th of July in the morning is kind of like where all this is going to be happening from my geographical perspective. So um, yeah, we'll see how that turns out. And it's going to be quite interesting this time, isn't it not? So as I speak, I don't know what the results are. And if I'm late to get this video out, or if you're late to watch this video, then a lot of what I might say might be out of date. So if you can bear that in mind, then cool. Right, what I want to talk about today, of course, is um, basically uh, 2024 politics, if you like, um, viewed through the lens of Ken Wilber's spiral dynamics model, um, which is one of the most interesting philosophical models um, that I've come across, and I've spoken about it a few times in the past, right? But um, I want to try and go into a little bit more um, depth um, when it comes to certain things, because, um, you know, we are going through serious paradigm shifts in this world. And when you go through serious paradigm shifts, one of the things that happens is that people end up having different opinions, very radically different opinions, even, dare I even say, different facts. People end up at each other's throats, people end up arguing over all sorts of things. And, and although people tend to see opposing things and have completely opposing opinions, um, they believe that what they see is real. And um, that's the problem that we have at the moment. It uh, makes it very difficult, it really does. <clears throat> so what I want to do is I want to go through the uh, spiral dynamics model and, um, and apply it to that because I think this actually clarifies a few things. It's a bit, of a, it's a bit brain heavy, so bear with me. So as you can see on the screen right now, you've got the color-coded spiral dynamics model. And as you can see, the colors you've got there are you know, beige, purple, red, blue, orange, green, yellow, and turquoise. And I'll go through all of this uh, one by one, um, but I won't go into turquoise because, um, you know, I don't feel that I'm personally there. Not only do I not feel like I'm personally there, but also as well as that, it's not sort of, it's not on the menu for me, you know. Yellow's about as far as I get with this. So, um, you know, that's what I'm going to uh, talk about today. Now, to put it all in perspective, if you start from stage one, stage beige, beige basically says, yeah, life is a state of nature and it's sensible to act like other animals. So this was kind of like when we were leaving, what we call it, leaving monkeyhood and becoming human for the first time, before we kind of develop our minds or our understanding or our sentience, if you like, to a certain level. Now, the thing is, of course, is that sometimes that's still with us. Sometimes beige haunts us, you know. If we were being reactive, if we were being kind of reactive on a level that's emotional, that doesn't involve any mind, we might just react to something. Like say, for instance, if you, I don't know, you see a wasp or if you see a snake, your, your reaction, your reflex reaction is purely animalistic. That's like stage beige. So that's where you will be. So we still have a little bit of that with us, even to this day. It's kind of like at the, um, at the foundational end of, um, of, of who we are. So um, what I have to do now, you have to forgive me, I'm multitasking with my phone to look at this stuff that you will see on the screen. The next stage after that being stage purple, Life is mysterious and frightening. It's sensible to placate spirits and join together for safety. Now this was, um, every alternative um, color that you get here alternates between individualistic and collectivistic. So this was kind of like a collectivistic thing. This maybe takes us back to tribal times, pre-Christian, like pagan times, shamanic times and stuff like that, where we would feel these fears and with our early minds, with our lack of actual knowledge that we know now, we were dealing with mysteries and were these mystery spirits and then do we have to tap into good spirits and bad spirits in order to be able to, um, you know, to get through and do we need to band together and create rituals in order for us to be able to get through life, so to speak, right? Now, of course, you know, back in the day when I suppose um, I was in a lot of spending a lot of my time in entheo space or psychedelic space, it actually put me into a state where I could go back to the feeling of awe and terror uh, that you know the people in the old days uh, would would be feeling because um, a lot of my ability to feel that has been taken away by the knowledge that we have now. 
So I suppose that, you know, going into states that could be, you know, compared to animism was good. And therefore I could feel that there were mysteries. And, uh, you know, so there's that. But of course, you know, then we had to advance. And then the next stage after that was red. Basically, life is tough and dangerous, like a jungle. It's sensible to fight to survive in spite of what others want. Now, of course, the benevolent fighters to survive would be the, um, the hardest man in a tribe or whatever, who would fight off and, and, you know, get groups of people together to fight off the other people, the hostile tribe, neighboring tribe that they didn't want to be. And that might have been the start of tribal wars and stuff. But the more malevolent and sociopathic end of this would have been people like, you know, the original warlords, if you like, like Genghis Khan, who just, um, you know, became the oldest person around and bent everyone to his will. And then they set up the first empire, so to speak. And, you know, so uh, when you're dealing with um, someone who, who wants to, you know, be hyper masculine, you could say that parts of Andrew Tate are still in red, you know. That would be a good example there, right? So the next stage after that that came along was um, uh, stage four, blue. Now as I say, before going to blue, red was a kind of individualistic thing, just like individual hard nuts would, would fight out to see who was the hardest. And of course, you know, any world that they would have created with them at the top would have ended up in the collective stage blue. Life is directed by a higher power. It's sensible to obey a higher authority and be faithful to the truth. Now, that higher authority could be someone like Genghis Khan. It could be someone like a king or an emperor. But then when religion come into it and you had absolute monarchies and they'd say that the king was appointed by God, then basically it meant also God, so therefore religions. And uh, I would argue that the present day equivalent of what we still have that's at stage blue would be something like radical Islamism where it's, you know, it's absolute and you have to go buy it. And anyone who, um, anyone who uh, goes away from it or is an apostate, um, you know, then you know, death to them or whatever. So they're very absolute in that. But, but there's a good example of what stage blue would be. Medieval Christianity as well would have been at stage blue too. So that's something to bear in mind. So I don't appear to be prejudiced one way or the other. It's like treading on eggshells these days, isn't it? The next stage would have been stage orange. Life is full of viable alternatives. It's sensible to pragmatically test for advantages to succeed. Now this I'd say would have been kind of like the earlier stages of capitalism, like, you know, especially like 1980s greed and excess. It does have a good side to it in that like entrepreneurs and the, mer the first mercantile classes or merchants that would have come along who, you know, found ways of being able to better themselves and bring up people in society, the, the early days of the, the free market. Uh, that would have brought wealth, that would have brought prosperity to people, would have brought a lot of people out of poverty. But the downside of it is that when it got to corporations or when it got to, you know, the greedy people, ruthless individuals as well as, you know, corporate entities that would have brought in crony capitalism, gangster capitalism, all that, oligarchs, that sort of thing. Um, so it has a good and a bad side. The next stage that comes after that would be stage uh, green. Life is a shared habitat all of humanity it's sensible to join community to experience shared growth now this is collectivist it started with hippies and you know back in the day it was okay because all the hippies would be holding hands peace and love and all of that but unfortunately in recent years this kind of collective green consciousness that wants to um, how to say wants us to accept these marginalized minorities like the like I say, the rainbow people, the alphabet people, ethnic minorities, and people who are different and all of that. They want the diversity and all the rest of it. Uh, you know, the intention was good. No one can argue. You know, the idea of having social justice and equality is not necessarily a bad thing when you think of the words. But then the problem with it being so collectivist and being as you know, they're not able to integrate other perspectives because the trouble is that if you don't go along with them, and they become more radicalised, as what's happened recently, you end up with this sort of woke dystopia hanging over us. So they've decided that everyone who don't agree with them are bigots and transphobes and homophobes and all of this stuff, right? But the trouble is that the group of far-right bigots is only a tiny fringe. But the trouble is that, you know, they become so zealous and so heavily ideologically possessed that they've lumped in the moderates in, literally anyone and everyone now who's a hair's breadth politically to the right of Chairman Mao or Stalin now is a Nazi scum. <laughs> That's the problem that we're living in now. 
Now, according to Ken Wilber and according to the people who do follow Ken Wilber's spiral dynamics model is, the problem is that these, these uh, colors that I've mentioned so far are tier one in, in the model. So the tier one um, models or colors, uh, whatever, they cannot integrate with each other. They think that their perspective is absolute, absolutely absolute. Um, they cannot, um, you know, integrate the whole idea of multi perspectives. And so that's where stage yellow comes in. Stage yellow, which is the next stage, is all about integrating all of the different perspectives of everything that came before it. And, um, you know, creating the idea of multi perspectivalism. Now, there's a big word for you. Uh, I only come across this word today, but I thought it was the best word to describe exactly what goes on. Now, according to um, what I've got on my notes here, it says in yellow, life is at risk of chaotic collapse. It's sensible to learn how to be free, but also principled. Right. So what's happening in the world at the moment is, uh, I mean, I, I got to try and tell you where I think I am in all of this. When I was, um, you know, going through all the countercultural movements, I think I was very much at stage green. But there were certain elements of stage green that I didn't like really that much. And there were certain elements of stage orange that I kind of thought would actually be good, you know. Um, but the trouble is that as time went on and as I saw that, uh, as I went through goth, as I went through crusty hippie, as I went through psytrance, as I went through all of these different countercultural movements, I started to notice that um, there was something about it I didn't like. They were starting to become more and more like the conformist societies or even more conformist than the normie mainstream world that I'd left behind or at least I wanted to leave behind. And um, there was just something wrong with it. And I was surrounded by yeah, gaslighters everywhere, people who were telling me about all these issues that I have, um, you know, uh, people telling me that I was doing the projecting, of course, they never done any themselves, did they? That's how I know what I noticed with these people too. I also noticed that whenever I had different opinions to a lot of these people, they would stop talking to me. Um, in which case I realised actually, no, these tolerant people are not very tolerant at all. These you know, accepting people are actually not very accepting. They're only accepting if you think the way they think. So there is only one way of thinking, only one set of opinions that you're allowed. And if you deviate from any of that or have any issues with that and you question it, then that's it, you're a heretic. And I realised that, you know, although this technically, according to this level, um, stage green was a higher, um, you know, a higher level of consciousness, if you like, or a paradigm shift above all the other ones, it had its flaws. And so in recent years, I kind of noticed that, yeah, I've, <laughs> I've gone and moved more back to the left hemisphere of my brain. That's one thing that's happened. Um, I'm also these days, uh, I've got to say, more sober, a lot more sober than I used to be, much more in my own mind than in any um, borrowed states of mind, shall I say, for using language euphemistically there. And um, I'm sort of just at that point now where I'm more interested in the bigger picture. I'm more interested in um, disassociating myself from all ideologies, no matter what is going on. I suppose there is some sort of level of ideological bias in me there, as I've kind of drifted away from the left. But the reason why I drifted away from the left, um, I don't actually think I've become right wing at all, to be honest. I just think it appears that way because we're living in a very distorted and skewed version of reality in this particular decade, in this particular time in history. Um, but the truth of the matter is that I'm at that point now where I realise and I see like a kind of an overview like as if I'm crawling into yellow, I'm crawling into stage yellow, I still have the residue of the other colours on me, right, that's the thing. I still have the residue of, you know, green and orange on me, but I'm crawling into yellow right now, according to this model. Um, then there's a turquoise level and there's levels above that. No, I don't think I'm there. I don't think it's really in my interest to even go to these places yet, right? And if I try to kid myself that I am going to these places, then of course, then I will become hubris filled and then I'll become a pretentious wanker. So I feel it's really important to be humble and at least try to know my place in all of this. Very important. But anyway, what makes me think I'm uh, crawling into yellow? Well, when people disagree with me about certain things I just think well that's where they're at that's that's basically where they're at that's what they see that's their perspective um, I don't expect them to see what I see because you know they're someone else they're different 
Um, and um, that's just with the rat, full stop, you know. And um, so I want to relate this to what I see with what's going on with politics at the moment. Um, how I see the changes that will happen. In order for me, I think, to um, get into stage yellow, I had to go back one step and actually embrace more of the stage orange while I was in stage green because I kind of needed to fuse a couple of things together to juxtapose to see, well, which is actually better for me? You see, I kind of think of myself politically as much more of an individualist than I do a collectivist. And even if it means, you know, going into a um, stage green, there are elements of it which are a level of higher consciousness and maybe higher levels of cultural sophistication than there is in the, what a lot of people would consider to be the selfish and greedy world of the individual entrepreneur or greed head who wants to make money and be materialistic. Well, yeah, materialism doesn't really appeal to me. That's the thing. But at the same time, um, the idea of self-actualization and sovereignty as an individual not being held back by other people and, and, and being free to think what the hell I like, have whatever opinions I want to have, and not, um, you know, be the hest of a, of, a, of a gatekeeper class that wants to tell me that I'm a bigot or whatever. Well, I don't want that. And so I kind of thought that, well, the best of both of these, what would happen to me if I just went along with it? And then, of course, I did. And um, I ended up losing friends, you know, like Brexit. You know, I got a lot of abuse when I said I wanted to leave the European Union. Um, I'm still glad we did, and um, I don't think the European Union is good for any country in Europe. Um, it's just a multi-headed bureaucracy, an anti-democratic gravy train, and um, a, a bloated leviathan monster that, you know, <laughs> gives levels of convenience to people in 27 countries, but causes a lot of other problems because you can't flip and change anything in Europe now. And it's, it's just all about centralization of power and all of that. And now you see a lot of countries in Europe are actually um, not wanting to have anything to do with it. And so you have this right wing populist movement happening. And I personally think, well, that's inevitable. It don't necessarily mean that I'm ideologically attuned to it, but I see why this needs to happen. You see, back in the day, according to the um, this spiral dynamics model. In the 1960s, um, the counterculture needed to come along and it needed to, we needed something that was progressive at the time because the old world was very staid and very stale and there was not much that could be done with it. There needed to be change and you know, the music of the 60s and the 70s and the images that you see of the countercultural movements at the time show that, yeah, the, the West needed uh, to kind of break free from the pre-war world, it had to evolve into something else. But the trouble is, um, you know, now we seem to be in a time where the counterculture seems to have become the establishment. And I think there was a couple of places where it all went wrong. Uh, one was Live Aid. You see, before 1985, when Live Aid happened, the rock stars were the genuine counterculture. They were like, you know, they were the edgy, naughty boys. They weren't part of the respectability class as such. But after Live Aid, oh, look at us, we give so much to charity and all of that. And then they started getting MBEs and OBEs for their works for charity. And then, you know, before you know it, they're, they, they're all going to Wembley Stadium and setting up these charities for ending apartheid and AIDS awareness and, and all the rest of it. And, and it just, you know, the music became politicised. It didn't seem like it had jumped the shark as much as it had now. But in the recent images that I saw of Glastonbury where Banksy put a, an inflatable dinghy with a bunch of, um, what was it, uh, inflatable migrants in it and it was being passed around by all of these people who were in Glastonbury who were talking about how, you know, um, you know, refugees welcome here and no borders and no walls and all of that while they're walled in in Glastonbury and be the first to complain about anyone coming in without a ticket. <laughs> yeah, and then after they left, they just left it a mess. They just, they just dumped all their rubbish there. They didn't leave it as clean as whence they came. They never do, right? Um, I can't help but think, well, there's certain levels of inconsistency and I just, just wish they'd shut up about it. I really honestly just wish that they would just, just be pop stars, be musicians, shut up about their politics. Don't talk about it on stage, man. You know, because I'd rather just uh, they just be about their art and nothing else. Now, of course, you know, when I um, do look at what's going on at the moment, uh, yep, 
You could look at Israel and Palestine, and I think looking at Israel and Palestine, yes, it's quite obvious and it's a no-brainer that um, there's a lot of innocent Palestinians who don't, you know, want to, uh, you know, be blown up and all of that, who have no choice but to be under the iron fist of Hamas and they don't want to be under the iron fist of Hamas but can't talk about it because they'll be killed and they probably, um, you know, are very displeased with the heavy-handedness of Israel attacking them, right? Fair enough, I understand that. Just like I understand that on the other side as well, the, you know, the Nova Festival um, that happened last year where a Cy, a, the Cytrans Festival that was attacked and massacred by Hamas. And it's funny how these um, the people who go to music festivals all seem to have conveniently forgotten them because they're now pro-Palestine. Like it's been memory hold. It seems a bit weird to me. All of that seems a bit weird to me. And I just think that like, you know, if you had people on both sides, if you had people who said, right, you know, uh, we, like, uh, we like the Israeli people, um, even though we have reservations about the Netanyahu administration, I think that's okay. If they said, we like the innocent uh, Palestinians, but we don't want to include Hamas in that, I would say, yeah, that's okay. But the trouble is, you don't hear that anywhere. And then you get this uh, group, Queers for Palestine, right? And I saw a video actually quite recently, it was on X, of a gay man dressed as a transvestite talking to a Queers for Palestine thing. Now this, this gay man was actually very sound. He was explaining to the Queers for Palestine woman why, uh, he, you know, uh, that he'd be killed uh, for what he is in Palestine, but he'd go to Israel and celebrate pride there. She didn't even know that the Israelis were Jewish and that the Palestinians were Muslim. He had to even tell her about that. So there's a lot of very people out there that are very undereducated that just don't seem to know anything about what they're protesting against. And this is getting more and more, this is getting more and more common. Well, there are some people, all right. I know sometimes I think, oh God, no, all these things like pride, they've all jumped the shark. But in and amongst the crowd, you will find some people in there who do understand what's going on, who do try to explain. And now there's a schism in that movement, you know? That's the thing, and you will find there will be more schisms in all of these movements. Uh, and, you know, that's how it goes. But what I want to get to at this point is, um, uh, the, I've got a mate who sees Nigel Farage in a very different light to the way I see him. And uh, I just want to explain it, I want to relate it to those colours in the spiral dynamics theory. It went back whenever I used to see in the 1980s and 1990s, whenever I used to see um, any stickers advertising any of the Nazi parties, the NF, the BNP, my first reaction to them was um, a stage beige reaction, an animal instinct, gut feeling, to uh, basically just to react unconsciously like it was disgusting. Um, that was my first initial feeling, that this is bad, this has to be stopped, this has to be wiped out because we knew how bad the far right were at an animalistic level. And then what happened, I think, as time went on, a little bit of collective gaslighting went on from the people on the other side, because I didn't have that disgust towards the far left. I had some level of disdain towards the far left, but that disdain towards the far left was more kind of, um, you know, from a higher level rather than from an animal level. I knew because of the Second World War and because of the history and because of the skinheads and all of that sort of stuff that the, that the far right were actually very sinister. It was very easy to see that they were. So my reaction was just purely animalistic. By the time it reached my brain, um, it had come from my reptilian side, basically. And so as a result of that, I think that as time went on, as uh, you know, we had all these different organisations. For instance, when Tommy Robinson first set up the EDL, there were black and Asian people in there, but people still believed them to be far right and still believed that the black and Asian people were, were I don't know, a kind of a, 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 like a front or something or like some kind of misdirection. Then when Nigel Farage set up um, UKIP, a lot of people believed that he must be racist because he wants to leave the European Union. And I kind of, without thinking, just automatically decided that this must be the case, even as recently as just 10 years ago, that somehow they were some kind of uh, enemy of sorts. And, well, I went through some kind of change in the way I looked at the world when I actually realised that when I left Totnes, a town where there was no point meeting any women because they were all man-hating feminists, where there was no point in having any friends because they were all trying to gaslight me or try to be my guru, 
where there was no point talking to people about any of my misgivings about the town, even though I wasn't being nasty or rude or anything, without them telling me, no, it's just in my mind, it's just me, it's just my issues, it's just my projections. They don't have any issues or projections. Living in a town where these people were too enlightened to be even have a sense of humour, sneering people, you know, and I realised actually that these were kind of like a new left that was uh, forming, and, I, and it was really obvious to me a few years later, when we got 2016, 2017, then when I voted for Brexit um, and I decided to vote Leave, um, this came purely from the fact that uh, I was thinking, well, decentralisation. Why do we need to have all these levels of government? Why do we need that at all? You know, why can't we have smaller government? You know, why can't we vote away um, a lot of these other things that we don't need as well? And any ch chance in a referendum to vote to get rid of a, 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 a highly centralised and highly huge level of government bureaucracy, I jumped at the chance. I wasn't thinking about whether I was left or whether I was right. So then I lose friends and then I kind of felt that when I was actually thinking about it, a lot of these people I thought were my friends were not my friends at all. And I was being treated like an outsider or a pariah by people who were pretending to be nice to my face a lot of the time. And I'd experienced that before. And I just thought that was completely wrong. So, so it made me reevaluate everything. And then I found out about the social justice warriors and who were they attacking. So then I started looking at what Jordan Peterson had to say um, to find out whether anything that he was saying really was as far right as people were saying. And how it all started with the pronouns thing. How it all started because he said, and I full wholeheartedly agreed with him on this, that the, the, the Canadian um, government wanted to bring in compelled speech. So you had no freedom of speech because you were compelled to say something by you know, calling that person a Z or Z, even though you didn't want to. And they wanted to make it illegal for you to not use the compelled speech that they were compelling you to use. And I thought, well, actually, that's a good point. Freedom of speech is you have to say this by government fiat or you're not allowed to say this by government fiat. And this was like the old communist world. And as I said before, I didn't end up um, with that level of animalistic disdain and disgust towards the communists like I did the Nazis. But then, as time went on, I sort of realised that, yeah, that I remember the Cold War, I remember the Iron Curtain. I remember, time went by, enough people forgot about the Cold War and the Iron Curtain. And all these subtle, insidious, like, reiterations of communism were coming back in. And, um, and, and I saw it, it was like a, what alcoholics would call a moment of clarity. So then I started, um, you know, wanting to find out what all these other people were saying and thinking. Um, now, of course, a uh, mate of mine who doesn't like Nigel Farage, did like Russell Brand at the time. And, um, well, I, so I thought, all right, I'll give him a chance. I watched hours of his videos and then I realised, no, he's not, it's not resonating with me. He's not saying what I'm going with. Now, Russell Brand has been through a few, uh, how can I say, self-reinventions and reiterations and all of this. And when he was cancelled recently for, you know, the, uh, let's say, the, 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 was it sexual harassment and stuff like that? The stuff that he was championed for only 15 years earlier. I was thinking, actually feeling quite sympathetic towards Russell Brand. And thinking, well, you know, yeah, it's a shame. He's, um, you know, he's gone off script. He's, he's talking about all these things. But then he has to go and flip in, get baptised in the Thames and become Christian. And he has to do it in such a, I don't know, celebrity sort of way. And I thought, oh, God's sake, Russell, what the hell are you doing? And so there's a part of me that's still a bit mm, about him, right? Now, again, you know, my whole attitude is to not get a fixed view of any of these people. But I know that there's certain people that I do resonate with and certain people I don't resonate with. And as I've noticed about Nigel Farage, I'm going to get back to him, is that, yeah, he uh, basically, anyone from the BNP or the NF, um, if he identified him joining his party, he'd get rid of them. Fair enough. So as a result, I think he actually done something good there, and fair play to him for doing that. There's a few out of context sound bites that people can get of him to say that he's racist, but again, you know, um, is there one about him saying that he, he wants to live next door to Romanians? I would like to know the full context of that. What did he say? If anyone in the comments can say the full context of that to me, then I would, um, you know, not, not the out of context soundbite, but the full context of it. That's what I want to look at more than anything else. 
Now, in recent um, weeks, what I have noticed is that there have definitely been a bunch of plants. He goes on question time. Um, all the people asking him the questions um, are accusing him of being racist and saying all bad things to him, which, if you take it from the perspective of any other political party or any other, any other situation where you would put people in the audience, you wouldn't get that. They're, they seem to have broken their impartiality rules there. They're not living by their impartiality rules. So none of the questions that they were asking him were about policy. There was an actor who was going around speaking like Alf Garnett, who was saying all this blatantly racist stuff. Right? Uh, now, I can understand why the people who are at the top, who are running the system that we have at the moment, which has definitely been co-opted by woke and by leftist ideology, um, include a lot of people who are very comfortable and are on a gravy train and have a status quo. The, um, what you call it, the, the stage green people who started out with good intentions, of course the road always leads to hell, does it not? Have got a gravy train, they've, they've got it nice and cushy, as it were, and they don't want the status quo to change because then they'll be out of a job, won't they? And so they don't want anyone who's gonna come along and challenge the status quo. Now, my, uh, understanding of this is that like from what I can see there has been deliberate like attempts to sabotage him but yet despite that and in such a short amount of time he's gone around and done all these talks and all these rallies um, the main speaker was his name Zia Youssef who was a, a, a billionaire entrepreneur made and sold a business and became the biggest donor who's actually looks like he's of Pakistani origin and join that party and of course um, there's, uh, there's, there's people from all sorts of ethnic minorities including the third in line Ben Habib in, uh, in uh, Reform UK who's half Pakistani born in Karachi but his mum was from his English and was from Isleworth near Hounslow where I grew up funnily enough well why would a racist employ these people why would a racist um, make sure to go out of his way to vet members of the BNP and in a situation like this where he has not much time to build a party it's understandable considering the circumstances that there will be a bit of reputation destruction attempted on him because he's trying to change the status quo and you're going to get these dirty tricks because it always happens in politics you know and that's how it is I mean all you have to do is uh, look at the Labour Party say for instance and I mean you know uh, I, I think from what I know, old Keir Starlin, uh, Keir Starmer, who will be the next Prime Minister, if we we're unlucky, um, he's married to a woman who's Jewish, so of course, you know, he'll want to deal with all the anti-Semites. Uh, of course, um, you know, uh, Jeremy Corbyn was referring to Hezbollah and Hamas and members of the IRA as his friends, right? So, um, you know, there's a lot of baggage there that he'll want to clear. They've got an image problem um, when it comes to stuff like that. And he'll want to clear out all of that. But there are still people who are saying and doing all these different things out there that are, you know, militant in some way. And the media is not um, exposing them as much. As well as that, the Tories, well, you know, we know what they did, do we not? when we were all locked down, when the Queen had to wear a mask and be on her own in the pews at her own husband's funeral. Pretty much on the same day that night, Boris and all that lot were partying. They were all getting drunk while they wouldn't let anyone else do it. One rule for them, one rule for us. Um, they basically subverted the democratic process by first they get rid of Boris, then their own party members bring Liz Truss in, and then uh, they just get rid of her and flipping you know a point Rishi Sunak in so they've undermined democracy they've done a lot of abuse during the lockdowns and all of this sort of stuff um, they've caused a lot of problems they've basically pissed the UK economy out the wall but they don't get as much of a hard time as, um, as Nigel Farage does so the way I look at it yeah if I was to relate this back to the spiral dynamics thing you could say that stage green um, at this stage has jumped the shark. It got to the point where it can't go on anymore. And maybe there needs to be a step back to stage orange. The people who are a little bit more on the political right. The people who um, are fed up of having so much equality and compassion shoved down their throat that no one has any um, sense of um, you know, respect for, 
well, basically moderate, ordinary people who don't want to be accused of being bigots. Maybe that does need to be a, a stage back. Maybe we have to find a way back to the political centre, not the far right, but the political centre. And maybe um, the only way to do it is by entirely changing the status quo, because the Labour, Conservative, Liberal, Green thing just looks like one party. It looks like one single organisation. And so maybe it's a risk worth taking. Now, of course, I think, um, you know, when I think back to how I responded to the NF and BNP um, stickers that I would see on walls, on trains and stuff like that, that I would always rip down, I still think I was right to rip them down, incidentally. I haven't changed my mind about that. But I noticed over time how I had been led to believe that people who were moving further away from the, from the far right and coming closer to the centre were still fascists in my head and are still fascists in other people's heads. And now I look at the far lefties who are calling people fascists and I cannot take them seriously anymore. I sort of just, just can't take any of this stuff seriously anymore. It just looks like a load of total bollocks to me. This level of polarisation, idiot polarisation that I see everywhere, you know, and, and I think that the, the problems don't really exist. And again, you know, it's like, uh, I've heard it being referred to as St George in retirement syndrome. These people wish they could have been in the 1960s fighting the civil rights movement and all of that, don't they? That's where they, where they wish they could be. Um, but because they're not in the 1960s and a lot of these problems um, have been fixed, they're trying to fix smaller problems, but they're counterproductive and counterintuitive in the way that they're doing this. So as a result, um, you know, um, I mean, I, <clears throat> I can at least think of myself as I can't remember ever being homophobic from, from a teenager onwards. I mean, God, I used to dress up in weird clothes when I was a goth, and as a result, half the town I grew up I mean, mistook me for being gay, and I was on the receiving end of abuse, so I know firsthand what they have to go through. And, um, you know, so I thought, well, I'm not going to be like that towards them. My issue is there's a political agenda there that is, is, is wrong, you know? And everyone's been reprimanded for being bigots when they're not. Because they can't find, they can't find enough fascists. They can't find enough racists. They can't find enough homophobes out there, right? There's a supply-demand problem, right? But somehow they believe all this to be true, and it's just utterly ridiculous. So there has to be a swing of the pendulum some other way, and if I'm looking at this from the stage yellow perspective. No, I don't see Nigel Farage as our, um, we call it, saviour. But the way I look at it is that people in the stage orange will see Nigel Farage as a saviour. People in um, stage green will see Nigel Farage as a Nazi or a racist or whatever. People in stage yellow will see um, Nigel Farage just as a, you know, and, uh, and reform and all that, just as a couple of... Uh, bug fixes to the present paradigm before the next operating system comes along. That's it. That's all I see, right? Bug fixes in the operating system of reality, but um, at the same time, maybe those bug fixes will cause other bugs, but maybe they won't. And um, so this is why I I'm, I'm want to bring to mind to everyone the concept of multi-perspectivalism. If you are multi-perspectival, what does that mean? It means that you can look at all these different political views that people have from all these different angles um, and completely detach yourself from them. It might be a, he might be a Nazi to someone, he might be a saviour to someone, he might be nothing more than basically uh, a paradigm shift or a bug fix to someone else. And um, it's very hard to actually know what the absolute truth is because in the time that we're in at the moment with so much uh, post-modernist thinking, it's hard to tell the difference between fact and opinion, and we can't even be sure that what's going on in our own minds is even real anymore because it's become like that. Because reality seems to have been deconstructed, and we don't know that we're not in echo chambers anyway. So for me, this is uh, what I see, is that once we get rid of woke, once we get rid of all of this bullshit, even if it means that the whole world has to become a little bit more traditional and conservative on the way there, um, basically, if stage yellow is the next level of mass consciousness, then I see a golden age coming at some point. It won't come right away, it might be about 20 years away, 
But I see a golden age, a real true late 21st century stage of enlightenment coming. I think it could be nearer than we think. And um, that's what makes me feel very optimistic about the future at the moment. And I feel in me, you know, my, how could I say, my spidey senses tell me that this change is not actually a shift towards the far right at all. It's not actually a shift towards, uh, we call it, um, backwards or anything like that. It's just a necessary correction of an overcorrection. And that's all it is. And that as time goes by, what will happen is, if we've become very aware now, and if the members of the right do try to go too much to the far right, enough of us will see that happening. And if I've seen that we've gone too much to the left and I don't like it, I, th I think I'm aware enough now to see that we're going to go too much to the right as well. And I will basically, you know, say that and call that out if I see that too. And I hope, you know, that this is where we go. I think stage yellow is where we are all heading um, at this point, according to the spiral dynamic model. And I think it's just a matter of time. Anyway, this video has been very long. According to what I see, it's over 40 minutes now. So, um, yeah, hope you're still with me. Um, right, I shall leave it at that. It's going to take a while to upload this one, I tell you. Nevertheless, see you later, alligator. <laughs> see you soon. Baboon. If you like this content, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And while you're at it, check out all our social media links. Please help this channel grow. Your help will be appreciated.